uh, between me and Simon, we have a, a division of labor. So Simon will start to uh, speak something very general about the project and also some uh, common themes uh, that uh, I mean have emerged from uh, uh, these uh, these this project brings them around the world and then I family will speak for about uh, eight minutes then I will uh, talk about uh, Bentham in China for uh, 10 minutes so Simon uh, how hi, is it? hi. Uh, can, ev is, is, can everyone hear me yeah I don't know yet yeah you're coming through here loud and clear Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I won't take long, about eight minutes, I think. So uh, first, a, a big thank you to Professor Schofield and the Bentham Project for continuing to run the Bentham seminars, uh, both over the years and through the current rather unique situation. Uh, I've always come away from them having learned new and interesting things about Bentham and Bentham scholarship. Thanks to Tajabo, my co-editor, good friend and colleague with whom it's always a pleasure to collaborate. And thanks also to the authors of the volume who in the end uh, contributed a collection of excellent essays that it was our privilege to edit. And a final thanks to everyone attending online. Uh, this special issue of the Journal of Comparative Law was an idea suggested to Jalbo and I by Michael Palmer, the journal's co-editor. And Jalbo moved quickly to bring on board Bentham scholars from all over the world. Each author was to contribute a piece on the reception of Bentham's work within a particular historical and geographical context. So included in the issue are essays on the reception of Bentham's ideas uh, in France, Spain, Germany, Australia, America, Italy, China, Japan, and Russia. Uh, today we'll be hearing from the authors that covered the reception of Bentham's ideas in China, Japan, and Italy. As with other special issues in the journal, the collection will form the major part of an edited book entitled Jeremy Bentham Around the World to be published by Wildey. Uh, we hope to include a few extra essays in the book, so do please look out for that. And we believe the issue and the book will together contribute to the growing global interest in Bentham studies, a development no doubt spurred by, by the important ongoing transcription and editorial work the Bentham Project is doing on Bentham's manuscripts whilst bringing out authoritative collective works editions of his text which are published by um, Oxford University Press. Uh, with the remaining time I have, I'll try very briefly to bring out a few general themes that emerge from the essays in the issue. Uh, the first theme relates to the perhaps unfortunate fact that though Bentham was a prolific writer, comparatively little of what he wrote was published during or after his lifetime. This creates a well-known problem in, ben in modern Bentham scholarship of figuring out whether there's an authentic canon for Bentham's texts, a problem effectively being de-problematized piece by piece by the Bentham Project's work on the manuscripts. But the material thankfully available to us now was not available to Bentham's historical interpreters. Instead, Etienne Dumont's heavy-handed redactions figure prominently in the wider history of reception that the essays together bring out. As a result, the essays further vindicate what David Lieberman once called an ever widening gap between the Bentham that was known to his audience in the past and the Bentham that's recoverable through closely attending to his manuscripts between what's sometimes called the historical Bentham and the authentic Bentham. The second theme relates to the task of locating Bentham's ideas on law and politics amongst a variety of significant traditions in the history of political and legal thought, including perhaps surprisingly the utilitarian tradition. Few would deny Bentham's importance to the history of liberal thinking and the essays generally bear that out though with some interesting exceptions. But the difficulties felt in accommodating his utilitarian moral theory 
into political cultures of a rights-focused stripe has meant that it's been Bentham's writings on law and political procedure, divorced to varying degrees from their utilitarian roots, it's been these writings that have historically enjoyed the most success. Indeed, the notion that Bentham's legal and political thought could be compartmentalized and assessed independently of its utilitarian background may have contributed to its being seized upon by authoritarian modes of thought that Bentham might have thought considered might have considered anathema to his basic ideals and the interpretation of Bentham's picture of law along putatively non-moralized lines was of course popularized in the 20th century by Bentham's most influential interpreter Herbert Hart how sustainable that sort of separation is has been a topic of interest to modern Bentham scholarship and I believe Jalbo um, Philip Schofield and Gerald Postema have all been prominent resistors. So it's interesting to see in the essays what might be called the historical antecedents or at least analogues to Hart's interpretive stance. <clears throat> Finally, further evidence of this sort of historical interpretive compartmentalization is shown in the essays with respect to the reception of Bentham's view of human nature. Non-liberal readings popular outside Anglo-American contexts and mostly inspired by Michel Foucault's analysis of Bentham's support for surveillance as made manifest in Bentham's design for an ideal prison, the Panopticon. Uh, these non-liberal readings have tended either to ignore the close connection Bentham envisioned between his utilitarianism and his view of human nature or, as some of the authors point out, some speaking today, mischaracterize that connection. But as some of the essays show, Bentham's mature political theory can't be fully understood without a sound appreciation of both. Uh, his mature political theory combines a generalization about the epistemic advantage yielded by an ordinary citizen's unique perspective on what serves their interests with the utilitarian junction to maximize utility, um, it combines them to form uh, what Philip Schofield called the first utilitarian case for democracy, for distributions of political power that allow for an ordinary citizen's unique perspective to appropriately inform political outcomes. So for the mature Bentham then, um, democracy must have approximated something close to a universal ideal uh, second, perhaps only to his utilitarianism. And maybe this isn't enough to make him a diehard liberal, as some of his critics have maintained, but it must at least make the mature Bentham uh, a staunch Democrat. As more collected works editions of Bentham's writings are published, the relationship between Bentham's ideas and the history of legal and political philosophy will continue to be revised, furnishing new grounds for reimagining the relationship between our political ideals as well as their heritage, um, such as the ideals that make up uh, the liberal and democratic traditions. We hope that the wider historical and geographical context given to the reception of Bentham's ideas provided in the issue will assist in that endeavor. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Many thanks indeed, um, Simon. So I think we're back to Shabo now. Uh, yes, uh, I have prepared a PPT. Uh, let me see whether, how can I share it? Uh, can you see the... I'll, I'll upload it to the chat, Shabo, you carry on. Okay, thank you. Uh, my top topic is uh, uh, Bentham in China. So I, I will uh, finish in uh, uh, ten minutes. I will talk about three things. The first is uh, the first is uh, uh, some uh, very uh, basic uh, facts about uh, uh, Bentham in China. Um, Uh, the, I mean, the paper, in fact, the, the, the chapter, my, my chapter uh, 
uh, focus on the reception of Bentham uh, in modern China, that's uh, between uh, 1902 and 1949. Uh, the year of 1902 is uh, special because, I mean, this year, the, the greatest uh, uh, Chinese reformer, Liang Qichao, uh, published, published the first systematic uh, account of uh, Benthamism in, in, Ch in Chinese. Um, modern Chinese scholars uh, learned about uh, the West or about Bentham mainly in two ways. Uh, first, I mean, a few intellectuals knew Western languages and studied in the West. So they imported uh, Western learning directly from original uh, texts. But, uh, I mean, secondly, uh, most scholars, they went to Japan uh, because of the proximity and also the linguistic similarity between Japan and China. Uh, they went to Japan to study the uh, Western uh, theory or thought. The, Jap the Japanese had already translated many uh, Western books, and these translations naturally uh, served as a, a convenient shortcut for the Chinese to, you know, into uh, Western uh, learning. Uh, it's uh, it's difficult to 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 ascertain precisely when Bentham's name first appeared. Uh, in Chinese literature, but uh, it is known that uh, it had already appeared in the Chinese translation of Thomas Milner's uh, History of uh, England, which uh, was published in Chinese uh, in 1856. As I said just now, in 1902, Liang Qichao published the first systematic account of Bentham's moral and constitutional theory. Between 1902 and 1949, about a dozen scholars published important pieces of research on Bentham. Uh, these articles, in fact, are the basis of my uh, chapter. As a result of these works, uh, Bentham's the theory, especially his utilitarianism, uh, became an influential force in the world of Chinese thought. Uh, okay, so I. The PVT, I mean, I think it's the second second slide. Uh, I gave some quotations about uh, Bentham's influence in modern China. Uh, just uh, one example, for example, uh, Xu Jilin, a Chinese philosopher, said uh, around the May 4th movement of 1919, the influence of utilitarianism was surprisingly uh, tremendous. Um, But despite uh, the significant influence of utilitarianism in modern China, uh, none of Bentham's books were translated before 1949. Uh, this fact is even more puzzling, considering that many intellectuals learned from the West via Japan, whereas the writings of Bentham and Mill were among the first Western books that had captured the Japanese mind in early in the early the Meiji era. Bentham's major works had been translated into Japanese uh, during the 1870s and uh, 1880s, whereas in China, the first translation of Bentham's works appeared only in uh, 1993. Uh, in Mao's China, Marx's uh, pejorative comment on Bentham uh, was made widely known. Uh, Benthamism was considered as a theory of exploitation, typically uh, representing the mentality of the ruling bourgeoisie, uh, interested only in promoting their own uh, utility, vague, selfish, shopkeeper-like, and reactionary uh, philosophy. Uh, the period uh, between the reform and opening up in uh, 1978 under the present day has been an golden era for Benthamism. A number of uh, Bentham the book, uh, let me see, this is uh, the slide, uh, okay, the page four. Uh, a number of Bentham the books and also books on Bentham have been translated into uh, Chinese. So slide four is a, a list uh, chronolo chronologically comparing the 
you know, the Japanese and the Chinese translation of uh, Bentham's work. Uh, the books on Bentham that uh, uh, have been translated into Chinese in, uh, include, you know, Halevi's uh, The Growth of Philosophical Radicalism, uh, Schofield's Utilitarian Democracy, Posthumous, Bentham and the Common Law Tradition, uh, Hart's Ethics on Bentham, and also very recently, uh, Fred Rosen's uh, Classical Utilitarianism from uh, Hume to, to Mill. These books uh, are important books, but uh, they were only translated in the past, uh, I mean, 20 years. Uh, many students have chosen Bentham as uh, the subject of their PhD thesis. Uh, uh, slide six is a list of uh, the, I mean, from uh, 1988 until now, eight PhD theses on Bentham. You can see that uh, these uh, theses are all on Bentham, the legal theory. This uh, has a lot to do with, you know, uh, Herbert Hart's influence. Uh, we know that, I mean, uh, for the uh, dissemination or reception of Bentham's thought around the world, in fact, uh, uh, second, uh, secondary materials or secondary literature on Bentham uh, may be even more important uh, than uh, Bentham's original uh, text. Texts, we have uh, the authentic, I mean, Schofield's Bentham, uh, Boring or Dumont's Bentham. Uh, we also have Marx, Bentham, Foucault's Bentham, and Hart's, uh, also and posthumous Bentham. These Chinese uh, students, in fact, uh, they, they all wrote uh, their thesis on Bentham, the legal theory. This, has, this, this was really uh, uh, influenced, the result of, of Hart influence. Uh, slide slide uh, uh, seven, uh, that's about uh, uh, a conference uh, on Bentham's uh, legal philosophy uh, taking place in China uh, 20, in 2012. Uh, the papers, uh, the English papers were uh, published as a, uh, a book on Bentham's theory of law and public opinion. Um, these are the basic uh, uh, facts of uh, the uh, uh, spread or dissemination of Bentham thought in uh, China. Uh, okay, the second thing uh, I want to uh, talk, about, talk about is about uh, the translation. Uh, the translation of, of, utility, uh, of the concept of utility and uh, utilitarianism. The translation is important uh, because the current term, uh, the current translation uh, of utility, utility or utilitarianism uh, in Chinese is uh, is pronounced as uh, gong li. Uh, so this is slide, uh, sorry, slide uh, nine. Uh, and and both in Japan and in China, this is considered widely uh, regarded as a mistaken, misleading uh, translation. Uh, this translation has very bad negative influence on uh, the reception of Bentham uh, in Japan and in China. Um, because literally, it means uh, a short-sighted pursuit of material uh, benefits. When the uh, East first, you know, came across the Bentham's works, uh, uh, they, they, they invented many different translations, uh, some emphasizing the idea of use, some emphasizing the idea of happiness or interest or pleasure. But finally, uh, this uh, very misguiding translation, Gong Li, uh, was adopted and uh, became popular, became the conventional uh, translation. Uh, a Chinese scholar from Shanghai, uh, Li Qing, according to him, uh, this uh, 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 has a lot to do with uh, the Japanese, uh, uh, sorry, let me see, Japanese philosopher, 
uh, E no tied to zero. Uh, according, uh, according to uh, Li Qin, uh, E no tied to zero was a very influential uh, Japanese philosopher. He uh, first uh, translated uh, utilitarianism into uh, Gong Li. Uh, Tetsu Jiro knew English philosophy very well, and he knew Ch ancient Chinese philosophy very well, but he really uh, didn't like utilitarianism. When he translated, uh, because he's very influential, so that's why his translation uh, was adopted, but uh, when I mean, when when uh, he translated uh, uh, utilitarianism into Gongli, uh, he gave him uh, he offered two explanations. First, uh, he said that okay, this uh, translation this, this term was from ancient Chinese uh, Gongli, which in Chinese uh, means uh, short term short sighted uh, pursuit of material benefits. And then he said that okay. Uh, Utilitarianism is very galicky and not uh, chewable. Uh, so that's why I gave this name, uh, this very bad name to, to utilitarianism. And by giving uh, this very bad name to utilitarianism, uh, he wanted to stop the reception uh, uh, and also the dissemination of, of, of utilitarianism. Uh, so that's the story. Uh, that's the story. I think he is very, uh, very. He was very successful because this translation was adopted, and this translation had a very negative influence uh, on the reception of Benthamism in uh, in China and also in in Japan. I think my time has <laughs> run out, so I will stop. Uh, I will stop here. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Shabo. Um, it's really interesting and. Um, we're now going to um, turn to um, um, Professor Kaino in um, Doshisha in Japan, and who's um, written the cha the chapter or the the um, the article in the um, Bentham and Around the World um, issue on um, Bentham's reception in Japan. So, um, Professor Kaino, I hope you can um, you can join in. Oh, can you hear me? Oh. Professor Scofield? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can, can you hear me? And uh, can you hear, uh, can you see the uh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint file? No? Okay, well, I think I've lost, I've lost you for the moment. Uh, oh, oh, there can you are. I can oh, hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, can you see the PowerPoint file? Oh, uh, you cannot see. We can see you and we can hear you. You're fine. So. Oh, uh, what about my file? PowerPoint file? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, no, go ahead. Uh, You're fine. We can see you. We can hear you. Oh, can you see my PowerPoint file? No. Tim, we need to see the um, PowerPoint file. For the PowerPoint or? Yeah, I've just uploaded it to the chat. If you can't see the screen, you'll be able to download it. So can I begin? Yes, please. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michiro Kaino, and I'm from Doshi University in Kyoto in Japan. And I first would like to thank Professor Schofield, Tim, Simon, and Francesco uh, for this wonderful opportunity. And I also would like to thank for the audience. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to speak on my paper, which I submitted to Shabo and Simon. Uh, however, uh, there are most recently some important events for Benson studies in Japan. So I'd like to speak about these recent events as well. And if I can, I'd like to share my PowerPoint file with you, or, or hopefully you can see it uh, by yourself. <clears throat> we can say that there are two periods when interest in the works of Benson increased in Japan. The first period was at the end of the 19th century, when Japan tried to modernize or westernize the legal and political system. 
And during recent years, as I'd like to speak later, the Benson and Utilitarian studies are flourishing in Japan. Or if you have PowerPoint file, please go to page five. Well, first, I'd like to speak about the influence of Benson's legal and political thought in, the, in late 19th century Japan. Uh, the major restoration of 1868 marks the end of government of samurai and the beginning of the imperial rule by Emperor Meiji. The leaders of Meiji restoration tried to strengthen Japan against the threat of Western colonial powers. And after three year, three, 300 years of national isolation, and at first, there was a need to introduce modern civil and penal codes in order to dismantle the unequal treaties that, has, that had been introduced by Western countries. Uh, these treaties, uh, demanding the modernization of the legal system, deprived Japan of certain benefits, such as economic autonomy. Uh, the ruling elites were therefore very eager to study foreign ideas on legislation, which led to the translation of some of Benson's work into Japanese. Oh, oh, five, six. The works of Benson, which were translated into Japanese in Meiji era, shows how the objective of the translators were reflected by the texts that were selected for translation. The first two of Benson's works that were translated into Japanese were Principle of the Civil Code and Principle of the Penal Code, uh, translated respectively in 1876 and 1877-9. Uh, the original text of these translations were chapters from Richard Hill's edition of Theory of Legislation. And in 1878, a Secretary of Provisional National Legislature translated and published Principle of Legislation from Hill's edition of Theory of Legislation. Uh, it's possible that Benson's theory of law as orders of the sovereign was particularly appealing to the Japanese legislators because it might have enabled legislation to be passed quickly. Uh, I, I like to go to five, five seven. Uh, German influence was evident in the criminal code, and in the civil code, uh, promulgated serially in 1960, 1896 and 1898. This was in part because Japanese law had been based on the statutory law system even before the Meiji Restoration. Benson was, of course, critical of the common law system and proposed his panomium. However, it seems that Japanese lawyers in the Meiji period considered Benson's codes too incomplete to meet their needs to enact codes of their own. Uh, file 8. The other reason why Benson's legal theory made little impact on the progress of Japanese codification is related to Japan's nationalism. Uh, Nobushige Hosumi, a leading realist and statesman of the Meiji period, acknowledged that while Benson and his codification system were developing a strong reputation among his colleagues, uh, Benson's plan disregarded nationalist sentiments. And please go to uh, file 9. <laughs> In the 1880s, the movement towards drafting a constitutional code and setting up a diet became more influential. And many private drafts for the national constitution were written and submitted. And the objectives of the translation changed accordingly. In 1882, Benson's fragment on government was translated and published. In the same year, although it had only 36 pages and its original text was unknown, uh, Jane Benson's principle of constitution was published in Japanese. In 1883 to 4, the second edition of IPML was also translated and published in two volumes by Munemitsu Mutsu, a famous politician and diplomat. So please go to file 10. <coughs> uh, Benson's writings on parliamentary government and freedom of speech also received attention after the imperial edict for the opening of the National Diet Parliament was issued in 1881. Thus, Benson's On the Liberty of the Press and Public Discussion from Volume 2 of the Boring Edition was translated and published in 1883. However, in spite of the translator's efforts, the Meiji Constitution was not Bensonic at all. Hostility towards political liberalism grew among rulers in the late 1880s, and the Meiji Constitution, promulgated in 1889, followed the example of the Constitution of the German Empire. And uh, although the Imperial Parliament was established in 1890, the major demand of the freedom 
and people's rights movement for true democracy remained unfulfilled, and only those who paid a sub substantial amount in property taxation were franchised, uh, which was 1.1% of the population. And the file uh, 11. Uh, there's a movement for democracy called the freedom and people's rights movement in the 1880s, when the introduction of constitutional code and a diet were debated. In the 1880s, many Western liberal ideas were introduced and uh, introduced into Japan. And the most remarkable discussion of Benson theory in the major period was uh, by Asa Ono around 1880s. From 1871 to 1874, Ono studied in New York and London before becoming a bureaucrat. Ono was quite liberal and he proposed the introduction of the British model of parliamentary government to Japan before the Japanese imperial constitution was promulgated in 1889. And in 1879 to 1880, Ono wrote an article uh, entitled uh, General Idea of Constitution, which suggested that Ono had read Benson's Constitution Code in Volume 9 of the Boring Edition extensively. Uh, if you have five, please go to uh, 12. <laughs> in General Idea of Constitution, for example, Ono argued that the ends of a constitution are security, subsistence, abundance, and equality. He also developed similar arguments to those of Benson in his discussion of the moral, intellectual, and active aptitude of public officials. In general idea of constitution, Ono also argued for the introduction of unicameral legislative system based on Benson's arguments that upper houses were not only useless, but were commonly detrimental. While Ono's work did not influence the establishment of political institution, they do provide evidence of Benson's influence in terms of providing direction for those who propose a liberal and democratic society, even in 19th century uh, Japan. Uh, for number 13, even in the time of reaction in the late 1880s, uh, Benson's works continued to be differenced. However, in 1887, Anarchical Policy was translated and published to oppress the movement for rights. And although there was also another demo democratic movement in the Taisho era, which was from 1879 to, uh, 96, to 1926, the interest in Benson also faded as it had in the major era as Japan became an authoritarian society. So uh, in Japan, the interest in Benson became increased only when society became freer and more democratic uh, I think which may also hold true for other countries. From the beginning of the Showa era, which was from uh, 1926 to 89, researching or publishing the works on Benson was a somewhat reckless behavior because the military was gradually gaining power over the state. However, uh, even after the World War II, Benson was at first treated unfairly. Owing to the large gulf between the rich and the poor, Marxism was temporarily popular uh, in Japan after the World War II. And the Karl Marx famously labeled Benson as a genius in the way of bourgeois stupidity. And Marx's description influenced the academics of Japan to some extent. And after the 1970s, authoritarian interpretation of Benson were influential in Japan as the rules and Dawkins' criticism of utilitarianism. <clears throat> and please, please go, oh, if you have five, please go to uh, 15. As uh, uh, I think I mentioned as a beginning that interest in Japan, interest in Benson increased uh, significantly in Japan after the fourth ISIS conference in Tokyo in 1994. From 1997 onwards, uh, professors uh, Nagai, Arie, and Fukagai uh, began to invite uh, Benson scholars, such as uh, Professor Guidi, Kerry, Lieberman, Long Queen, Dozen, and Professor Squid to give seminars in Japan. Uh, younger uh, Benson scholars who contribute to the special issue of review of Benson studies, uh, about which I will speak later, attended these seminars as graduate students. Many monographs and edited volumes on Benson have been published recently. Oh, please go to uh, file 16. 
For since entering the 2000s, many monographs, translations, and edited volumes in Japanese are published, and the number of books on Benson and Utilitarianism amounts to, uh, I think, 12. Uh, of course, I don't go into detail about each book, but uh, I'd like to show uh, some of them, some point of them. Uh, in 2006, Hayako Komatsu published a book on Benson theory of education, and in 2007, uh, Kaoru Ando published a book uh, which emphasizes more authoritative nature of Benson's theory. And please go to uh, file 70. <coughs> Uh, Satoshi, Komada, uh, sorry, Satoshi Kodama then published two books on UT Italian ethics. And his introduction to UT Italianism, a first book on ethics, uh, has been particularly wide read. And Kodama's reply to the criticism of UT Italianism are now, I think, widely uh, accepted among the academics and non academics in Japan. And then please go to file 18. <coughs> Uh, Professor uh, Schofield's uh, Benson, A Guide for the Perplex, was uh, also translated and published in 2030. And uh, Yuchiro Kana and Shin, uh, Shintaro Obata's uh, recent translation of Professor Schofield's book also stimulated interest in Benson uh, outside of the traditional sphere of Benson scholarship in Japan. And uh, then uh, the 30th conference, 30th ISIS conference, was held in August 2014 in Yokohama. And there are quite a lot of Japanese audience. I think some of you uh, attended the conference. And uh, more than 50 participants from Japan uh, shows that uh, Benson and Utilitarian studies are attracting a lot of interest now in Japan. Uh, please go to uh, file uh, 19. Uh, I direct, I also would like to uh, add that uh, the there's a book that is the challenge of Jeremy Benson, published in, in 2015, was the first collection of academic papers on Benson in Japanese. And uh, uh, please go to uh, file 20. So, sorry to hurry you. Please go to uh, file 20. And I also would like to add that a uh, translation of Professor Schofield's UTT and Democracy was uh, published uh, in this uh, January. And uh, I'd like you to go to uh, file 21. <coughs> uh, I'd like to apologize for introducing so many Japanese books on Benson. However, uh, you may read Japanese researches on Benson from the uh, special issue of uh, review of Benson studies. Uh, thanks to uh, Center Benson in Paris, and especially the chief editor, Professor Bruno Ernst, and, uh, and of course, Malik, uh, we published the first English collection of academic papers on Benson on December last year. Last year. Almost all the Benson scholars whose works I have introduced contributed to the volume. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to skip to uh, file uh, 23, please. <coughs> uh, now I'd like to go back to uh, discuss Benson and Japanese society. <coughs> and I'd like to focus on recent Benson studies and the Benson, uh, recent Benson studies and the Japanese society. Uh, some Benson scholars in Japan have focused on the authoritarian nature of Benson's thought. For instance, one of the topics that uh, Hiroaki Itai discusses is Benson's theory of indirect legislation. <laughs> In his article entitled Benson's Indirect Legislation, Itai acknowledges the relevance of the subject, subject matter to modern society and argues that Benson's idea of indirect legislation is an archetype of governance through the medium of architecture or the built environment. Uh, I think these are, ah, uh, there are, uh, please go to uh, 524. Uh, there are other similar works, and these works seem to reflect our uh, recent social trends in Japan. Uh, for instance, uh, the majority approve of introducing enhanced systems of monitoring. 
Uh, there are also many contemporary examples of architectural governance. Uh, uh, it is uh, noteworthy uh, that many scholars outside of the uh, sphere of Bensam studies have referred to Bensam and his panopticon in order to justify these trends. And uh, please go to uh, file uh, number 25. <laughs> and uh, let's see, <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce Japanese uh, manga coming from Bensam. <laughs> Uh, I spoke, I think I spoke about Kodama's book of introduction to utilitarianism was influential and uh, Professor Scofield's uh, Benson, a guide of a perplex, stimulated interest in Benson in Japan. And I think we can find a uh, dissemination of research results in Japanese society to some extent. Uh, in 2018, uh, The Greatest Happiness of the Greatest Number, Manga Academic Series was published. Uh, it's, of course, a fictional story, and the main <coughs> uh, character, uh, who is a consultant and a disciple of Bensam in 19th century, and tries to resolve problems by Bensam's philosophy. Uh, what I'd like to uh, emphasize uh, is that uh, uh, manga, uh, this manga depicts Bensam unbiasedly and fairly. For instance, the main character influenced by, ben by Bensam argues against layoffs by using the law of diminishing marginal utility. And the main character also tries to protect a homosexual individual from the angry people by arguing that homosexual individual, individual is not harming anyone. And uh, if you can uh, see my PowerPoint uh, file now, please uh, see uh, page 26. Uh, and the, these are some parts of man, manga, and uh, uh, please see the explanation if you ha have time afterwards. And uh, please go to uh, 527, and now I'd like to conclude. Uh, I think uh, the duality of Benson's writing seems to explain his enduring influence in Japan. <coughs> uh, as we saw uh, in the Meiji era, when the freedom and people's rights movement was still flourishing, Benson's liberal works, such as Fragment on Government and On Liberty of the Press and Public Discussion, were translated and published. In times of reaction, however, conservative politicians and bureaucrats relied on uh, Benson's anarchical policies. And uh, please go to the final page of my PowerPoint file. And as also seen above, Japanese academics st still draw on authoritarian elements and interpretations of Benson to justify setting up more cameras. However, uh, Benson's theory of publicity can provide assistance to uh, liberal-minded academics who seek to justify more disclosure of official of, of information. The Japanese law of administrative uh, information disclosure law, 1999, is based on an, an idea similar to Benson's in which publicity was a form of security for good government. Uh, so, uh, Benson scholars in Japan, I think, agree that uh, if we do not look at Benson from biased perspectives, perspective, Benson's theory will evoke ideas that are new and worthy of consideration. Uh, that's the end of my paper. So, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Kay. You know, that's a really fascinating account of um, Bentham studies in, in Japan. and. Um, recent developments and Professor Kaino sent me a copy of the um, of the manga which is um, is tr truly marvellous. Um, so um, anyway we'll, we'll, we'll without any further ado because as, as I said at the beginning we'll have a time for questions for all our speakers um, following the final presentation which is by Francesco Ferraro who's in Milan and will uh, has written in um, on Bentham's reception in Italy for the um, special issue of the Journal of Comparative Law. So, Francesco, I hope you're. I can see you're you're with us. So, um, if you'll begin, that will be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Philip. So, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Schofield, uh, Dr. Kozer, uh, all the other organizers of this Bentham seminar, uh, Michihiro Kaino for his lovely presentation, and of course. I would like to thank uh, Simon and Schaubo for giving me this opportunity to bring about a survey of Bentham's reception in Italy, which to my knowledge had never been attempted before. Um, 
I focused on the 19th century in my chapter in my essay because an assessment of the later reception uh, would have taken a whole another essay by itself. Uh, but also because I think it was more interesting, uh, more in, the more interesting period, period to inquire into uh, from the point of view of the history of ideas. And in today's presentation, I will focus specifically on the first decades of the 19th century. Now, I would like to give um, uh, a bit of um, a historical uh, context to, to my listeners. Um, as many of you will know, uh, when we are speaking of the 19th century Italy, uh, we're mostly talking um, uh, of a number of different states, uh, some fairly big or medium sized, uh, some others only slightly bigger than a city and its surroundings, uh, such as the Duchess of Modena and of Parma, for instance. Now, most of northern Italy uh, was under a direct Austrian rule, since the old Republic of Venice, as well as the Duchy of Milan and the Duchy of Mantua, uh, constituted uh, the so-called Lombardo-Venetian Kingdom, which was part of the Austrian uh, Habsburg Empire. Uh, the unified Kingdom of Italy was proclaimed only in 1861, uh, with huge parts of Italy's current uh, territory, such as the region of Venice and Rome itself, uh, were still missing. But uh, nonetheless, the circulation of ideas between the different parts of the Italian peninsula had never stopped, and a distinctively Italian strand of the Enlightenment had developed since the very beginnings of the 18th century. Now, as we all know, the Milanese author of uh, Crimes and Punishments, Cesare Beccaria, had gained a worldwide fame, and as we all know, he was also one of Bentham's most revered writers. While in southern Italy, in Naples, for instance, uh, Antonio Genovesi was the holder of the first uh, university chair specialized in um, uh, or the first in, in Europe and in the world, university chair specialized in political economy, properly said. Um, while another Neapolitan, Gaetano Filangieri, was the author of, of a huge work called The Science of Legislation, uh, which was translated in many languages, many different languages, and became hugely popular, although I have no idea whether Bentham, whether Bentham knew of, uh, of Filangieri's work. Uh, other thinkers, uh, like another Milanese, Pietro Verri, had endorsed the uh, early forms of utilitarianism. Therefore, when Bentham's works started to circulate in Italy, they found an intellectual background which was uh, already open to any new development in legal theory, uh, illegal reform, especially when it came to judicial procedures and to codification, and in economics. Now, the first reference to Bentham that we can find in the work of a prominent Italian intellectual uh, was made by Melchiorre Gioia. Uh, Gioia was a Freemason who sympathized with the French uh, Jacobinism and the French Revolution. When Napoleon occupied Northern Italy in his wars against the Austrians, Gioia was called to several public offices. Now, in Gioia's work on, on deserts and rewards, uh, published in, in uh, 1814, he made reference uh, to Bentham's uh, Theory uh, de Recompense, uh, edited by Dumont and um, published in 1811, and to uh, another of Bentham's works uh, edited by, by Dumont, uh, which was the Traité de Legislation Civile et Penale, published in 1802. Now, I'll bite with some specific points of disagreement uh, for instance, on the banality of public offices and on the conferral of the hereditary nobility as a reward, Gioia was in general very appreciative of Bentham's work, uh, and so was another northern Italian thinker, Gian Domenico Romagnosi from Parma. Uh, Romagnosi, uh, born in 1761, uh, died in 1835. Uh, Romagnosi was a jurist, a philosopher, an economist, and even a physicist. And like Gioia, he had uh, troubles with the Austrian authorities and was imprisoned, actually, for his uh, Jacobin uh, leanings. During the French rule of Milan, Romagnosi was called to collaborate on the reform of criminal uh, procedure. And in the third edition of uh, his treatise on the genesis of criminal law, published in 1824, he discussed uh, Bentham's analysis on the concept of uh, of obligation and his uh, criticism of both uh, contractarianism and natural law theory. 
Now, Romagnosi despised actually Bentham's materialism, but he approved of the decidedly practical orientation of his thought. He expressed his admiration for Bentham's uh, 13th chapter in the Traité de législation civile et pénale, which was a chapter on the mistaken ways of reasoning on the subject of legislation. Now, Romagnosi refers to Bentham uh, as a venerable old man whose zeal for the common good was such that his objectionable materialism usually had no negative impact on the remainder of his prescriptions about legal and political reform. Romagnosi also disagreed with Bentham's application uh, of the same account, a probabilistic account, which Bentham had given of legal obligation also to moral obligation. Now, uh, as we can see, um, Bentham is mainly taken into account uh, as a legal thinker in these, in these years. And further on and deeper into the so-called era of uh, restoration that is after the end of the Napoleonic era, other legal thinkers and lawyers explicitly referred to Bentham's works as milestones in the path of rational law reforms. This happened especially in the state, uh, uh, in the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, which had a tradition of enlightened uh, legal reforms. Uh, due to the influence of uh, Beccaria's book, uh, the Grand Duchy of Tuscany had been uh, the first state in modern times uh, to permanently abolish capital punishment uh, because of the uh, penal code reform under the Grand Duke uh, Peter Leopold in 1786. A generation of young jurists called for rationalizing the complexities of Tuscan law which comprised the customary law, judicial uh, precedents, and particular codes. Now, Bentham's name was first added to the authoritative thinkers quoted in Tuscan tribunals uh, by the lawyer Girolamo Poggi in 1827. Uh, and Poggi uh, quoted the Traité de Preuve, de Preuve Judiciaire um, in its uh, Italian translation, which was made in 1824, uh, and which preceded by one year the English translation. Poggi also discussed Bentham's ideas in a legal treatise published in 1829, uh, and mentioned him, uh, mentioned Bentham as the head of the so-called, uh, what he called the philosophical or rational school of law. Poggi also mentioned uh, uh, Savigny's um, historical school of law and Meyer's uh, textual or pragmatical school. While another Tuscan lawyer, uh, De Brando Paolini, translated from uh, French Bentham's essay on judicial fees. Uh, this jurist uh, considered Bentham as the, uh, let's say, the Francis Bacon of legislative science and a, cosmo a cosmopolitan philosopher who spoke the universal language of reason and was therefore a compatriot to any man who loves freedom. Um, these are all quotations uh, from Giuseppe Giusti, another Florentine lawyer. Uh, and um, Dumont uh, reported such, such expressions of high esteem to Bentham himself in their correspondence. Now to conclude this first part of the seminar, I would like to mention uh, also Pellegrino Rossi, um, born 1787, uh, dead 1848. Uh, who was one of the most outstanding jurists of uh, his era. Now, as uh, Guillaume, Guillaume Tussaud points out in his uh, editorial introduction to the Essays on Limits, uh, Rossi was the first to hold a university chair in constitutional law in France, because Rossi had been a professor of law at the University of Bologna, <clears throat> but then had to flee uh, to Switzerland due to the political turmoil at the end of the Napoleonic era. In Switzerland, in Geneva, he became friends with Etienne Dumont and Simone de Sismondi and founded a legal review. He is mentioned several times in Dumont's correspondence with Bentham. In his uh, inaugural article on the Swiss Review in 1820, Rossi referred to Bentham as uh, the most learned philosopher among jurisconsults and the most learned jurisconsult among philosophers. He considered the English thinker as the head of the uh, analytical school of legal philosophy and compared the achievements of uh, this school with those of uh, Savigny's German um, historical school. 
Although Rossi greatly appreciated Bentham's work, he criticized the purely consequentialist and utilitarian foundations of uh, Bentham's theory of punishment, uh, mainly on account of the pursuance of a deterrence effect uh, by using the condemned person as material me means to this end of deterrence. In this sense, in the case of death penalty, uh, Rossi observed that the head falling on the scaffold was destined to have the same effect of the newspaper telling of the execution. As we can see, uh, so Bentham was mainly known as a legal thinker and a legal reformer by the intellectuals of the Italian uh, peninsula during the first decades of the 19th century, uh, when the inheritance of the Enlightenment was, was still thriving. He was commonly considered as one of the most outstanding legal theorists alive, despite the obvious uh, differences between Italian and English legal culture. However, in the years immediately preceding uh, Bentham's death and in those following it, he started to be discussed as a moral philosopher. And this aspect of his thought uh, was generally uh, received worse and criticized harshly, especially by Catholic thinkers. Now, Baring's, uh, John Baring's edition of the Deontology was published, as we know, in 1834. At that time, in Italy, a new strand of Catholic thought was emerging, uh, which came to be known as liberal Catholicism. The relationship between the thinkers belonging to such tradition and Bentham's work was one of, of opposition, as one could expect. Because, of course, Bentham's uh, empiricist foundations, his um, uh, secularist and materialist, uh, uh, materialist orientation, and his uh, uh, legal positivism in the sense, uh, in the specific sense of opposition to any kind of natural law theory, were actually incompatible with uh, Catholic philosophy and morality. Nonetheless, in some notable cases, his writings were quoted extensively and taken very seriously. The first such case I would like to refer to is that of Alessandro Manzoni, born 1785, uh, dead 1873. Manzoni, uh, a Milanese, is best known uh, as a novelist, a poet, a playwright, among the most important ones in modern Italian literature. Manzoni was the grandson of uh, Cesare Beccaria. After embracing Voltaire's and other French thinkers' uh, secularist, secularist ideas, Manzoni returned to Catholicism after a deep religious crisis. And in a work titled Observations on Catholic Ethics, which was first published in 1819, uh, he tried to defend Roman Catholicism against the allegations made by the Swiss historian, the Simone, Simone de Sismondi, who held that it was Catholicism that hindered uh, the development of strong civic and moral virtues and values amongst the Italians. Now, in the second edition of the, of the Observations on Catholic Ethics, published in 1855, Manzoni added a long appendix on utilitarianism in which he almost exclusively uh, discussed Bentham's ideas. This appendix is actually a small treatise by itself and a very interesting one indeed, uh, since Manzoni presents a, a number of objections and, perplex and perplexities concerning utilitarianism, which anticipate the main issues of a uh, 20th uh, century ethical debate, namely uh, the alleged lack of a convincing theory of distributive justice, the setbacks of direct consequentialism, um, the problems of value monism, and the difficulties of accommodating uh, uh, moral intuitions. Now, in this work, Manzoni is the first to translate into Italian some parts of uh, Bowring's edition of the ontology. And uh, among the most, the most interesting, parts, interesting parts of his discussion of Bentham's theory, uh, we can find an analysis of Bentham's account of obligation and of duty. As we know, Bentham redefines those terms as names of fictitious entities and gives a probabilistic account uh, by ultimately, uh, ultimately tracing them back to the threat of a pain. Uh, Manzoni seems to favor an account closer to ordinary language, much like the account of obligation given by Herbert Hart in The Concept of Law. Now, some misunderstandings on Manzoni's part are actually blameless, since Barring's edition lacks some of the relevant parts uh, later included in the Collective Works edition of the ontology. However, Manzoni always shows genuine deference and respect for Bentham. Um, and the last 
case I'm going to refer to uh, is the second very interesting case of um, a liberal Catholic uh, discussing Bentham's works, that of Antonio Rosmini, uh, born 1797, uh, dead 1855. Rosmini was a priest. He is considered one of the most important Italian philosophers of the 19th century, and he opposed uh, Locke's and Condillac's uh, epistemological sensualism, and this made him an opponent of utilitarianism too, uh, which he saw an as, application, as an application of sensualism to moral philosophy. In Rosmini's view, Helvetius in France, Joy in Italy, and of course uh, Bentham in England, had embraced a subjectivist ethical stance because they had held that the happiness of the individuals was the basis of ethics. Rosmini also posed the economic thought of Adam Smith and David, and David Ricardo, which had been introduced in Italy by the likes of uh, uh, the aforementioned Gioia and Romagnosi. In his work, Rosmini criticized, among uh, other things, uh, Bentham's positivistic doctrine of, uh, of rights of legal rights and his greatest happiness principle, namely the formula, the greatest happiness of the greatest number, which he interpreted as allowing the sacrifice of minorities uh, to the interests of the greatest number. Rosmini took great pains to discuss and um, try to refute uh, what he called the Bentham's vulgar doctrines, uh, which seems proof that he considered him at the very least one of the main adversaries of Catholic morality. Uh, so I, would, I do not have time today to speak about Bentham's reception in the second half of the 19th century. I will just hint at the fact that he began to be taken into account also uh, as an economist at a time when economics was, uh, was starting to, to develop as an autonomous social science and to separate itself from legal thought and from moral philosophy. And in this sense, uh, Benthamic hedonistic utilitarianism was endorsed uh, by many as a reaction to the abstractions of Cantonism, uh, not to mention those of uh, German idealism. In this sense, so Bentham's name was usually associated uh, uh, with free tradeism and laissez-faire. Okay, I'm over, so thank you very much for, uh, for listening, for your attention. Hello, Philip. Uh, sorry, hello there. I um, sorry about that. There was um, a problem with um, gaining control of my computer. I think um, Tim was doing things. <laughs> Thank you, Francesco. That was a really fascinating um, paper, and um, it tell I think um, tells us a, 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 a well, as you said. I don't think anybody's written on those subjects before, and that was all very new to me. And um, so, and thank you to all our other speakers as well for a, a really interesting um, session. Now, as we said before, if um, anyone has got questions, you can please use the uh, meeting chat just to say either I've got a question, and then um, I'll. Um, I'll try and um, call you in. I'm fairly me doing it. I hope Tim will do it. And um, um, the um, or you can just write a question into the box, and um, I'll um, I'll read it out if 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 you prefer. Um, and that's not to stop our speakers themselves asking um, questions of each other um, if if they like. Um, until um, until um, anyone's got any questions, then um, let me um, start.